So these practices are one, explore and question, two, tinker, test, and iterate, three, seek out resources, four, hack and repurpose, five, combine and complexify, six, customize, and seven, share. All right, so here's a definition of the explore and question. This is from page 16. Quote, interrogation of the material properties of the context in order to find inspiration or to determine intention for a process or project, end quote. So with this particular practice, the author suggests that makers really enjoy and value inquiry and exploration through making and through the culture at large. Now, this is definitely something that can apply in a CS classroom as well. If you are going to use any kind of like inquiry or even project-based exploration that has more of an open-ended framework for the project, so it's not this like closed project where like everybody's going to create the exact same outcome. For example, you might be able to say, how can we solve this particular problem with different solutions or what kind of problems are in our community that we can address through our class and through computer science in general. So those are some different ways that you can kind of explore and question in computer science education. Kind of building off of the explore and question, the next one, tinker, test, and iterate. Here's a quote from page 16, a definition. Quote, purposeful play, experimentation, evaluation, and refinement of the context, end quote. So this strongly aligns with CS education, especially with software development. You're just constantly iterating on your ideas and you have to constantly test to find if there's bugs. And then from the tinkering side of things, it's just kind of like messing around, like trying to figure out, oh, well, what happens if I do this and experimenting some more. However, where it differs a little bit, here's a quote from page 20. Quote, makers are doers rather than planners, yet the doing is iterative and sequential. Makers model designs with software, they build and test prototypes, and they evaluate the processes to discover what is possible or to improve upon what has come before, end quote. So the authors then continue to go on and kind of describe that the iterative process is strongly valued within maker culture. However, this kind of iterative process is typically different than what goes on in CS education, in that in CS education, you usually have some kind of a plan in advance in terms of what you want to do or what you want to create. Now, whether or not the kids you work with are moving with more of an experimentation, like maybe through modding, like I talked about previously in previous episodes, and just kind of tinkering around and seeing what they can do. Or maybe they're going with more of like, they're gonna storyboard out what their app or their program or their project is going to do. And they're going to follow that and kind of iterate on it as they're working on it. That's kind of up to you in the classes that you work with. Okay, so the next practice, seek out resources. Here's a definition from page 16, quote, Identifying and pursuing the distributed expertise of others includes recognition of one's own not knowing and desire to learn, end quote. So this relates to a lot of what some of the guests on the show have talked about in terms of finding communities and finding other experts that can assist you with your own understanding. So the idea that knowledge is kind of distributed across the community is one that resonates really well with a lot of informal learning communities or communities of practice or affinity spaces however you want to define these kind of cultures or groups of people. This is something that can occur in the classroom itself. I have mentioned and guests have mentioned that they strongly recommend having peers help each other in a classroom or creating like an I need help list or engaging in peer-to-peer -peer feedback and learning or just even asking a friend for help if they get stuck, things like that. So this can definitely relate to what goes on in a CS education classroom. However, it doesn't have to be with somebody who's in a room or somebody that you talk to synchronously. This could also occur asynchronously if you have a lot of resources available online or in some kind of a discussion-based format. So for example, perhaps you could create a feedback system where one class is able to look at projects from another class that meets at a separate time of day and kind of provide comments or feedback. So as an example to that, when somebody shares a project in Scratch, there's an option to allow community members to share comments. So perhaps a, a fourth grade class might go and look at projects developed by seventh grade class and provide some feedback to them. Now this practice also relates to the previous Unpacking Scholarship episodes on mod culture. Uh, here's a quote from page 21. Quote, it is also frequently played out through the recruitment of friends and colleagues with diverse skill sets and knowledge, as well as through the active use of local community developed resources for discussion, design, and fabrication, end quote. So for example, we're tying it back to the previous scholarship, think about the teams that were developed for mods when I discussed some mod culture practices. All right, so the next practice, hack and repurpose, here's a definition from page 16, quote, Harnessing and salvaging component parts of the made world to modify, enhance, or create product or process, end quote. 
Here's a quote from page 22. Quote, Hacking and repurposing is a practice of problem solving and improving functionality, but it is also an act of improvisation and creativity and an opportunity to put the stamp of individuality on a project or process, end quote. So as I've discussed and some of the guests have discussed in prior episodes, you're going to be borrowing bits of physical hardware or maybe software, chunks of code or functions, and applying them in some kind of a new context. So this is something that is, is valued among maker culture, the idea that you are going to repurpose something or tying it back to mod culture, you're going to mod or remix something to make it do something new. So you might take a little bit of pieces from this project and some functions from this project and maybe some sprites from this other project, and you can combine them into something else, which relates to the next practice, combine and complexify. So here's a definition from page 16, quote, Developing skilled fluency with diverse tools and materials in order to reconfigure existing pieces and processes and make new meaning, end quote. And here's a little elaboration from pages 22 and 23. Quote, the practice of developing skilled fluency with a diverse set of physical and digital tools, materials, and processes of construction in order to put these existing pieces and processes together differently is central to making and enables makers to extend what is possible. Inherent in this practice is an impulse to learn and an acknowledgement that there is always more to learn, that what is not yet known is a deep personal interest, is learnable, usable, and useful to oneself and to the community of makers. The practice of combining and complexifying is a practice of lifelong learning." End quote. Now, this really relates to my approach to CS education. When some districts have asked for my advice on what kind of platforms they might use, what I recommend is that they find platforms that allow them to combine and complexify, essentially, to use the author discourse, various computer science practices, concepts, understandings, etc. So, for example, there's a tendency among the more puzzle-based or problem-based platforms that have one right or wrong answer to solving things and don't really enable opportunities for creative expression to not really allow for kids to combine and complexify what they're doing. What I recommend for districts is that they instead find platforms like Scratch Junior or Scratch that allow you to take these various concepts and practices and kind of combine them in interesting ways that allow for kids to dive deeper. So rather than learning the same base level concepts and practices and understandings in computer science, in a variety of platforms, what I recommend instead is to dive deep into one that allows you to combine all these ideas into really complex projects that are individually meaningful for kids. So speaking of, this kind of builds off of the discussions on modding. The next practice, customize, here's a quote from page 16, quote, tailoring the features and functions of a technology to better suit personal interests and express identity, end quote. And here's a quote from page 24, quote, through the practice of customization, makers tailor the features and functions of a technology to make it their own, end quote. I cannot recommend this enough. If, if you can in some way make it so that your CS class allows kids to kind of customize things to make it interesting to them, not only does this make this like personally meaningful, but it can also tie into the idea of culturally relevant pedagogy. So I highly recommend thinking of the ways that the projects that the kids create in your CS classroom or your classroom that integrates CS, that the projects themselves are extremely customizable. Okay, so the last practice, share. Here's the definition from page 16. Quote, making information, methods, and modes of participation accessible and usable by members of the community. End quote. So here's a quote from page 25 on the findings. Quote, makers openly share and access the stuff of making with the entire community of makers through diverse platforms for presentation, reception, and communication. Often characterized as open source, the maker community works to develop repositories of information, kits, and systems of communication, which make tools, materials, methods of design and fabrication, and products accessible, customizable, and usable by the entire community. End quote. So the thing I love about this is it's not just sharing the created product itself, but also sharing how to create that product. So in other words, encouraging development of understanding through engaging in the process itself, rather than just looking at an end product that somebody created. So I've mentioned in previous episodes that one thing that you might be able to do is have kids create their own resources that are then used by the current class or even future classes down the road. So this is another example of how you might be able to do that. Now, one thing that you might want to take into consideration when creating these kind of resources is figuring out, okay, will these resources be available only to the classes I work with? 
to maybe in the school that I work with, maybe the district or outside of the actual community itself. So for example, we make it so that anyone in the world can find access to these resources. So my own personal preference is to make it so that the resources are free to use for the larger community, because you never know who might be able to find access to them. So for example, all these stuff on my website, jaredoleary.com, 100% free, get hits from all over the world from people who are interested in either computer science education resources or music education stuff. This excerpt was from episode 16 of the CSKA podcast, which is titled Making Sense of Making, Defining Learning Practices in Make Magazine. You can listen to this full episode as well as hundreds more at jaredoleary.com or by simply searching for the CSKA podcast on your favorite podcast app.